We are in 2 Peter chapter 2, and I'd like for you to go with me in your Bibles to that section of Scripture. Now, I would like to jump up into the, the verses just before this chapter, actually. Peter is saying, we didn't, def, you know, we didn't come up with these fables and make up this story. He says, we actually were there on the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus' countenance was changed, and he lit up and he glowed, and we saw the glory of him. And we heard the voice from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. This was the real thing. We saw the glory of God manifested to us in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. And then he says, we have more of a sure way through the prophetic word in verse 19. And so we have the promise, uh, the prophetic word made more sure. To which we do well to pay attention to a lamp shining out of a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy or scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And all that had happened when Jesus was walking on the earth, it's almost really crazy to chart what he did and what he said to the Jewish calendar almost. He fulfilled the law and he was walking and he was quoting the law and he was doing the things that fulfilled the prophecies that men of old were moved by the Holy Spirit and spoke of the one coming. And this was an evidence of who Jesus was. This was an evidence to those who were hearing to prepare their hearts for Jesus Christ to come and to be the Savior of the world. And so we have these scriptures today. We have the account of Jesus' words. We have the apostles writing who are moved by the Holy Spirit and spoke from God to us, who give us messages that are relevant and will always be relevant to the end of time. Now, along with that, Peter, knowing that he is going to die, for it says in chapter uh, 1, that I know that my time is at hand and I'm going to be moving out of this body, he focuses in on some things that he sees as coming that they, he needs to, to set up a guard against. And he begins to explain to them in his last words how things are going to come down. And he's speaking prophetically what's going to happen after he leaves. I think about it as I leave for Iraq. I, I was told that we should get uh, insurance, but they said, oh, but by the way, there, you can't buy insurance for Iraq because it's a war zone. Come at your own risk. And so I thought, oh, my word, I could, you know, uh, be in a bad situation. And if I, if I knew that I was not coming back, what things would I tell you? What's important for, for that person to really make known what's really important? And that's kind of what we get today. We get this kind of inside view of the Apostle Peter writing to these churches who are really churches that Paul started. And he begins to, with his heart, knowing that he's going to be passing away, he's speaking prophetically of some things that are going to happen. Look at verse 1. <clears throat> but false prophets arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Peter's saying this, and Paul said it in Acts chapter 20. He said, I know that there'll be ravenous wolves coming in after their own desires when I'm gone. Peter's saying, after I'm gone, these guys, false teachers, are going to come in and spread false teaching, secretly introducing destructive heresies. When you think about the work of Jesus, you are his workmanship. You think about the glory that God has in his children, just as I have in my grandchildren and my, my daughter. And we all have this sort of, this, this loving glory. And I don't know what it is when it's family. I don't know what it is when you hold that baby for the first time, you know. I, I watch the Zinhoffers back there just showing off their baby. And you, there's something about just that, oh, man, how could you love, instantly love this little human baby? And you do. And you do. It's part of you. 
And it's something like that with God. He loves his children. And, the, and all of his energy and all of that he's done throughout histories is to free his children, to make them his, from, to redeem them from destruction, to make them who were enemies his children. And now that he has us in his, at his table and he glories in us, what would the enemy do to really get to the heart of God? He would go after his children. He would go after his children. And one thing I've learned about pastoring is you can say something that offends somebody once in a while, but you offend somebody's children to them and look out. You know what I'm talking about. How many of you here are teachers, school teachers? God bless you. Boy, we need a lot of Christian teachers. You know what it's like, you know, you, you, you have to tell the parents that their little darling isn't so perfect. And they're not. Uh, and how defensive. And, and it's like the enemy comes and when he wants to bring the glory of God down, he attacks the children of God because we are to share in his glory. And, and Jewish tradition says that's why Satan rebelled in the first place is because he heard that, that God was going to create man in his own image and that angels would be servants of these, these people. And he says, no, I will be like God. I will be higher, you know, and he rebelled. And now what is his focus is to destroy through heresy, through false teaching, to pull people out of the glory of God and bring them back to something that's less than what God has worked and died to set them free to become. And so Peter writes and he says, I see and I know firsthand about this. Now, one of the things that Peter got to hear Jesus teach was the teaching about in Matthew chapter 16. And I'm going to go there and I'm going to read to you just a little bit here in Matthew uh, chapter um, 16. When Peter himself, now this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach this false teaching thing a little bit different than probably you've ever heard it. Because I just felt like as I was praying and studying, God gave me some really neat insights that I want to share with you that become quite obvious, actually, as you look at the author and where he came from and what shaped him, and now what he's writing these words to the, these people about. It kind of puts it together for you. For instance, Peter himself had been, had been misguided by Satan to destructive heresy. Oh, oh, pastor, he's the pope. Come on, you can't believe that. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Or just reflect back, because most of you know that passage. Jesus is asking, who do men say that I am? Some list, uh, some John the Baptist, some Elijah, and some of the other prophets. And then he turned and he said, but who do you guys say that I am? And Peter answered. He said what? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus actually, in the Greek, it says he gets really excited. And he says, wow, Peter, flesh and blood, that's not your thought. That was from God. It was a revelation from God. And I tell you what, I'm so excited. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loose. And upon this rock of revelation, I will build my church. And the gates of hell cannot stand against it. And Peter goes, huh, revelation from God. Yeah, and so he's cruising, you know, and he's excited too, and Jesus is excited. And then it says from that point on, Jesus began to tell his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, that he must suffer, that he must die, and that three days later he will be raised from the dead. And Peter, what did Peter do? Took him aside and said, Lord, you're the Messiah. That can't happen. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah, and the Messiah will not die. You do not have to go to the cross. And what did Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. You don't know, you're, you're only caring about your own desires. You see, Peter, listen, listen, this is so important. It never really struck me until I was studying this week. Anything short of the cross of Christ is heresy. Are you with me? Jesus had to go to the cross to die. 
Satan was trying to give him a backdoor, saying, oh, there's some other way. And Jesus himself is struggling with God in the Garden of Gethsemane. Isn't there any other way? Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want, Lord. And so Peter himself had tried to go to a crossless salvation by saving Jesus from suffering. And it was not of God. It was of the devil. And Jesus said, you think you're being nice to save me, but you're really into some bad teaching and some bad thinking, and that is of the devil. Anything that, listen, folks, anything, any message today that offers salvation apart from the cross of Christ is a destructive heresy. Now, Peter knows what a destructive heresy is. Now, I, I, I think it's really important for us to see something about this text. He says in this passage of scripture, he says that among you will come these false teachers. It says false teachers and prophets will rose among the people just as they also will be false teachers coming into you. No. Among you. They will be part of the church. And they are among you. And they will go off into teaching that is destructive and heretical. And they will be right here among us. Now, the first thing I want to do when I see that is I want to look for it. Too bad that was not there. And then I realize something just hit me, just like a ton of bricks this week. I could be just like Peter. You, you could be just like Peter. One minute, moving in divine revelation. The next minute, trying to proclaim a crossless Christ. And I realized that Peter understood something himself by his own misguided thinking. And that there are people, and that I think there are, and I don't think there, sometimes I think it starts off where they're not intentional, but then it turns to where it is intentional to draw people after themselves because of greed and lust. We're going to read about that here in a few minutes. But they're among them. He says, denying their master, denying the master who bought them. Now, these are not from the outside. These are among them, denying the master who bought them with his own blood, paid for. They turned away from the commandments, verse 21 says, these same teachers who turn away from the commandments of the Lord. They were there under the commands, and then they turned away from the Lord. Now, here's, here's the thing I want you to think about. Jesus gives us the parable of the wheat and the tares. And he said, you know, the farmer went out and he told his servants, gave them good seed, and they sowed good seed. I'm paraphrasing. And uh, they, when the seed sprouted and started coming up, uh, they noticed that there were wheat coming up, but there were tares, and tares look like wheat, but they're weeds, and they're not good. <laughs> and so the, the servants came back to the master and said, Master, didn't we sow good seed out in your field? And they said, Yes, you did, but an enemy has come, and he has sowed tares among the weeds. And they said, Should we go out, and should we pull them up? Should we get rid of them? Should we pull them up? And Jesus said, no. And this is the surprising thing. And this is the revelation that really just popped in my mind. You've probably seen this. I'm the last to see it. But to me, it's fresh. So I, I, I just got to be excited a little bit with you, okay? If you know this, just go with me. Because I, I, I just am so turned on by something I gained this week uh, through studying this. They said, Shouldn't we go and pull them up? He says, no, let the wheat and the tares grow together. In the end, God will separate them. Now, at the same time, he's warning against false prophets, and he's going to get very specific with that. 
So is Peter pulling them up or is he letting them grow? What's he doing? Watch this. This is something. This verse is the key to everything I want to say today. Verse 9. I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. I'm so excited. Oh, forgive me. We better read down to verse 9, okay? And many will follow, verse 2, their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will, ex uh, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. <laughs> For God... If God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and confined them into the pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but, pre but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with several others, when he brought a flood upon the earth of the ungodly. And if he, commanded, if he condemned the city of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example... <clears throat> to those who would live ungodly thereafter. And if he rescued Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, <coughs> unprincipled men but for by uh, what he saw and heard, that righteous man while living among them felt his righteousness, his righteous soul being tormented day after day by their lawless deed. Now here it is. Verse number 9. Read it with me carefully because this is the key verse. He gives all those examples to say this. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from, from temptation. One translation says from testing. And to keep the unrighteous under judgment, under punishment, until the day of judgment. Now... I'm uncomfortable with letting the wheat and the tares grow together, as maybe you are as well. But he says, let them grow together, and in the end, God will separate them. And you think, well, that doesn't sound like a good plan for farming. You know, uh, I, I grew up on a farm, and I can remember walking the bean fields pulling weeds. I can remember when the corn is this tall, my uncles and grandfather would go through with cultivators and take the weeds out between the rows. And has anybody have any agriculture to know what I'm talking about? You take the weeds out from among the crops. And so to me, that seems like a better plan. But when you re realize in verse 9, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, suddenly you begin to realize that there's someone in control, even though Satan is sowing seed, God does not seem to be as um, up in arms as I am, as the servants were. Now watch this. This is so good. This is Deuteronomy 13. I'm going to read that, and if you'd like to go there, I invite you. I'll give you a little bit of time to go to Deuteronomy. It's in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. Verse 13, or chapter 13. <coughs> Excuse me. This is this verse in verse nine really helped me understand the wheat and the tares, and, and I, I think you're going to like um, you're going to like how God sorts things out as you read this because you, you may, may make you feel uncomfortable, but I think it's important for us as a community to realize. How should we respond and act with different situations? Uh, and here it is, chapter 13, and I want to I read verses 1 through 5. If a prophet or dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning that which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods um, whom you have not known, and let us uh, serve them. You shall not listen to the words of the prophet or that of the dreamer of dreams. Now watch this. Here it is. Here it is. Ready? For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him 
and you shall and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, and serve him, and cling to him. But if that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall um, shall be put to death because he has counseled uh, rebellion against the Lord your God, who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you uh, to the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall um, plunge this evil from, purge this evil from among you. So now he's telling them two things. Number one, he's telling them when this happens, sometimes it happens to test people's hearts. And I think that's probably what was going on with Peter when he was confessing, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus is excited. And he says, flesh and blood didn't give that to you. That was a revelation from my father in heaven. And I'm going to give you authority with the keys, whatever you bind and loose. And then, and then he tells him he's going to go suffer. And he goes, no, Lord, no, 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 that can't happen. That, and get behind me, Satan. As if Peter's heart was being tested. And sometimes I realize that I, I don't always understand who's God and do we have, can you lose salvation? You have all these theological questions that swirl in your head. But then you read the parable of the sower and the seed is good and it lands on different kinds of things. But what happens is one says, because the word is sown, uh, it's tested. It's tested. And so there seems to be this thing where God will, bring somebody along, and then they'll, be, they'll have a seed that will come along that will take them down the wrong path. Well, we're to respond to that. We are to respond, and we're to actually deal with that false teacher. Uh, you know, we have, we'll take them out, and with snowballs, we will uh, stone them. <laughs> um, Judy was doing that this week with a possum that wouldn't move and hissed at her. She took snowballs and... Uh, Halted the the poor hissing uh, creature, uh, creature, <laughs> Peter's dying. What's going to happen? What's going to happen after I leave? There's going to be false teachers. He said, "I know it. They're going to come out from among you, and they're going to have false teaching that is destructive. It will lead people astray." Now. I've watched different doctrines come and go throughout the church and seen the destructive paths of many doctrines over the 35 years that I have been pastoring. And I myself have been led astray into some false teaching and I've come back. And the thing that I want to convey to you today is this. You are like Peter. I am like Peter. Um, we are all susceptible um, to being led astray. Uh, I remember in the 70s, I was confessing that my stub was going to grow out because I heard that if you confessed it right and said it right and didn't doubt that it, anything you asked, whether it was a Cadillac, which some people were into, I was more into the Porsche, or the finger, it didn't matter. You know, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, you know, the, the Copenhagen kind of thing, you know. Um, you didn't get that, but it, 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 going astray... How susceptible are you to certain false teaching? And, and one of the things that really this, this chapter really lit up with me is that we are susceptible. And, um, <clears throat> but there is a security that you and I have. If we're really his, he knows how to rescue us and bring us back like he did Peter. Now, watch, I'm going to unfold some of this stuff because it's really uh, fun. Now, let's talk about some of the false teachers. Uh, what is their character? Verses 10 and 11, let's read on. And especially those who indulge in the flesh, its corrupt desires, and, its, uh, and despise authority, daring, self-willed. Do not trem uh, tremble when they revile against angelic uh, majesties. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against those before the Lord. And there's a verse just like this in Jude, by the way. And a lot of this is just like the book of Jude, this chapter, by the way. We'll get more into this when we get to Jude. But these, like unreasonable animals, born as creatures, and here's where my wife's example comes in, 
unreasonable animals born as creatures um, of instinct to be captured and killed. There you go, Judy. I could say Lisa LaChapelle's name uh, with possums as she took and found a nest of possums in her trailer one time and didn't know what to do and grabbed a pair of scissors and killed them all. <laughs> She's quite the lady. <laughs> what do you do when these false teachers invade your home and your space with destructive things? You stun them, right? Okay. I hope Lisa loves me after today. Are you here? She did. She stabbed him with the scissors. She's, I mean, you did? Okay. Um, now, these people, what is behind their character? Verse number 10 and 11 is pride. They indulge, they despise authority, they're self-willed, uh, they revile against, and Number 12, they're ignorant like a bunch of ignorant animals. And notice what it, God says about these. Animals, uh, creatures of instinct to be captured and killed. Their whole purpose is just to come and sow destructive seeds, to be captured and to be killed. That's what they're like. Reviling, where they have uh, no knowledge with the destruction of those creatures also to be destroyed, suffering wrong as um, wages of doing wrong. They commit, um, they commit, uh, they count it a pleasure to revile in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reviling their deceptions as they carouse with you. So they're still among them, having eyes full of adultery and never cease from sinning, itching, uh, enticing, excuse me, I can't read very well, my contacts are blurry. Enticing, unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accused, uh, cursed children, trained in greed. So they have ignorance, they have lust, they have covetedness. And now, what are their claims? Verses 17 and 18. They are springs without water and mist driven by the storms of whom... The black darkness has been reserved. They are like springs when you're thirsty. You go there, but they're dry. They promise you something they cannot deliver on. And most heresies promise a deeper secret truth. Once you have this, it is so life-changing, and you get it, and your life still sucks. They uh, promise freedom. Look at verse 19. Promising them, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. They're enslaved themselves, but they're promising freedom. But when you get into their stuff, you become their slave uh, in, their, in their bondage. What is their symbolic examples? They're unreasonable beasts ready to be captured and killed, and that's what they're made for. They're stains and blemishes, 2.13 uh, says. Stains and blemishes upon the real. They, are, they have greed, like Balaam. Look at verse 15. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of uh, Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he received a rebuke of his own transgression, and if I had the King James, I might quote it for you, the dumb ass speaking with the man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet, and so we have many false teachers today um, that are worse than the dumb ass speaking with a man's voice, I just thought that was funny, but you didn't, <laughs> don't you like the King James sometimes? Last time we, we taught through 2 Peter chapter 2, I knew Sherry had King James and I made her read it. Do you remember that, Sherry? Okay, that was funny, but it wasn't funny to you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> They're like Balaam. Balaam was for hire. And uh, he couldn't get the job done. Every time he would speak against the children of Israel, God would put a prophecy and a blessing in his mouth. 
and it would come true. So then he says, hey, this is how you really get the God angry at them. Send some uh, worshiping, seductive females in their midst, and the guys, when they start taking them, God's anger will come, and that's what happened. And so he, he paid, he took money just so that he could have for himself and watch God's children be destroyed. And he said, these guys are like Balaam. They fall into that same sort of greed that Balaam was taken with. They are dried up springs, and they're, they're driven storm clouds. And they're, look at verse 22. <laughs> they are, they are uh, dogs and hogs. <laughs> I'm glad I put in my notes. Verse 22. It happens uh, to them according to... The true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. Well, God calls them dogs and hogs. I thought that was funny, but you didn't either. <laughs> now, their promised doom is seen in verse 1. Their, their destruction is waiting for them. Verse 3, it, their judgment's not idling, it's hovering over their heads. Verse 4, they're exemplif uh, they exemplify... Um, uh, by judgment of fallen angels. They, they're, they're rebuking fallen angels, evidently, in verse 4. Um, it's exemplified, their model is exemplified in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood. These are what these people are like. It comes creeping in, you're susceptible, and it's like the flood, it's like Noah and the flood, it's like Sodom and Gomorrah, and God is going to deal with it. Uh, and, but he knows how to save the righteous and keep the unrighteous under judgment for that day. Now, that's the cool piece, verse 9. Now, I want to close with this because this is so fun. Verse 9. Let's go back to verse 9 because that's where. Oh, here, here's one more thing, verse 20. For after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they again entangle them, uh, entangled in them and are overcome. The last state will be worse than the first. For it would have been better for they had not known the way of righteousness, having known it, and turn away from the holy commandments delivered unto them. And so um, these people would have been better off had they not even been bought by Jesus himself. Now look at verse 9, because this is so cool, and then I want to go back just to, to these three examples. Number 1, uh, verse 9, it says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from this testing. If false teachers, as it says in Deuteronomy, are among to test your heart, where's your heart at? The real issue is not necessarily all up here, although you should know things. You should know what you believe and why you believe it so that you can pick out. Somebody says, why don't you teach more against false teachers? I said, you teach the light, and suddenly when somebody introduces false teaching, it becomes obvious. And that's my kind of theme. And so when I teach through the book of uh, the Bible, I get to these passages and I teach it because it's important for us to know so that we can recognize because these heresies seem uh, uh, okay, but they're destructive once they're lived out. And we're all susceptible, just as Peter was. Now watch some of the, I want to I do this because I want to give some examples now of some people that God rescued that looked like they were off. And this is why you have to be careful not to pull up the, wheat, the, the tares with the wheat. Lot. Look at it. It uses Lot. Hello, Lot, for an example. Are you, are you reading the book of Genesis like I read it? Lot did not seem like the upright character that Peter's carving him out to be. Do you think so? It's like, who is Lot? He's compromising. He's in this evil city. And what does he do? He throws some people outside so that the, the perverted take them instead of his guests. Hello? He's righteous? Now watch this, because I think this is really interesting. He, he talks about Lot. And uh, I find it interesting. He condemned Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction, reducing it to ashes, having uh, made them an example for those who live ungodly thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by sensual conduct of the unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man 
while living among them, felt, uh, felt his righteous soul tormented day and night with their lawless deeds. Now the Lord knows how to rescue Lot. And I'm going, first I'm thinking that's not fair, and then I'm thinking, wait a minute, maybe I'm Lot. There's a part of me that's susceptible. Maybe I'm like Peter, and that means that God will bring me back from my weird teaching and confessions that I used to be into and for a short period of time. And he brings me back, and he rescued me. And I don't know how many times I have been probably going down the wrong path that God says, no, go back this way, or he, he rescues us. And I think Lot is an example of someone who God saw as righteous that you and I probably wouldn't see so much as righteous, and we would have pulled him up and threw him into the fire. Amen? But God did not. He knew how to rescue uh, Lot. Let, let's go to a, more, um, a, a little more New Testament example. How about Apollos? Apollos loved God, but he was teaching a baptism of John and was not complete. And Priscilla and Aquila, what did they do? Did they take him out and stone him? They took him into their home and said, look, what you're teaching is so, you know, so two years ago. Jesus has come and died, raised from the dead, and he is the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. You can preach the gospel more clearly now. And he goes, oh, great. And he went on and he preached the gospel and he became, you know, one of the <clears throat> pillars of our faith. God knows how to rescue us when we don't have complete understanding. Um, God knows our hearts. It's a test. How will God deal with you and me in this time when heresy comes among us and we're, we're tempted to go off into some weird uh, tangent, okay? And Peter himself was one. Now, look at Noah because Noah is an example too. How did God rescue Noah? I would say that Lot and, um, and Apollos and Peter were guys who could have been pulled up as tares by mistake if you're not careful and thrown in the fire but then we have the clear uh, ones are Noah. And look at what it says about Noah. And did not, God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the whole world of the ungodly. Now, if you read Genesis 6, it says that the human race was beginning to be polluted. The sons of God and so the daughters of men were beautiful, and they went down and they had offspring, and God says, I cannot keep going like this. I will not tolerate this. And so he says, I'm going to send a flood, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. I'm going to get Lot out, and I'm going to get Noah out, and they're going to proclaim a gospel through building a boat for 100 years. God's patience was there preaching through Noah, saying, you can be saved. You're being tested right now, but you can be saved. Come and join us and build this boat because it's going to rain. They said, it's never rained before, and the floods are going to come. It's going to lift this boat and up above the judgment, and then it's going to come back down, and we're going to have a new place to do life. And God spoke through Noah, and he rescued Noah, and he rescued Lot, and he rescued Apollos, and he rescued Peter. Now, go in closing. This is my last one here. Go with me to Luke 17. Because this is Jesus talking about the end of the world. He's talking about the end of the world. Jesus is saying, be careful, there's going to be false prophets that come, and you're going to miss me, and they're going to go say, look, there's Jesus over in the desert, or there he is, don't believe it, don't listen to him, don't go, it's a seed to test your heart, but know this, trust my word more, know this, and look at verse 26, and just as it happened in the days of Noah, so shall uh, be also the days of the Son of Man. When Jesus comes back, what's the last he's going to be? It's going to be like Noah. People are going to be preaching that judgment is coming. The end of the world is coming. There's a great seven-year tribulation that's going to test the whole world. It's coming upon us, 
and we are the church, and we are preaching, the, the bride says, the bride and the bridegroom say, come. And the Spirit says, come. Join us. Escape the tribulation that's coming upon the face of the earth. Okay? They will be eating and drinking. They will be marrying, and they will be given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed us. Us? Us? No. Who? Them. 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 So how's it going to be when Jesus comes back? God's going to take us up above the tribulation, and then we're going to come back with him. So shall we always be with the Lord. First Thessalonians says this, that don't grieve, because he's going to descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm excited. It's going to be like the days of Noah. Now, look at verse number 28. And it was in the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, and they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it, re it, it uh, rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Folks, I believe that God knows how to rescue us from the coming judgment. And he's going to take us out before he brings down the judgment. That's just my view. I know you can have the view that we're going through the tribulation if you like. And uh, may it be as you believe. That was another joke that you did not get. What am I so excited about today? I'm so excited because I didn't realize that God allows our hearts to be tested. But I have a secure feeling in my life today that, you know, sometimes you wonder, am I really going to make it? Am I really going to withstand the trials and the tests that come my way? Will I still be standing at the end? Will I be looking in faith when Jesus comes back? But here you are today. You've gone through testings. You've been through trials. And God has proven and he has sealed you and he's proven that you're his and you're here today after going through many, many tests. You should feel the security of God. But you shouldn't rest on your laurels because you, like Peter, like Lot, you know, like Apollos, um, we could all be susceptible to something uh, that could come and test us. Where is our heart? Are we walking humbly before the Lord our God. And so it shall be that Jesus could come back before I go to Iraq, which would be just okay with me, because there's a snowstorm in Chicago where I'm driving. But, uh, and you have a test on Monday. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, right? Okay. I don't know, maybe I'm more excited than you are about this. Uh, I, I think I am. Uh, but I just feel so good that the Lord knows me. I, Sarah, where are you? Come up, come up here to the worship team. I love what you sh said, Sarah, about God knowing us is part of knowing him. That was so rich. That meant a lot to me. The Lord knows us, and he knows how to rescue us from going astray. Are you glad about that? And do you feel secure in that? And should you rest in your laurels uh, because there will be false teachers that you need to reject their teachings. Will you, never mind, let's just worship the Lord. <laughs> let's stand together.
And as I seek your face, may I understand that it's by your grace that I am here. Just a Just know 